Let's take a slow walk back to June 2019, when Fantasia Bunko became the hottest thing off the errata free Japanese Bushiroad presses. If one were to take a quick look at the cards, it seems pretty simple to build. Throw some of Objectively Best Girl in, and a Sword of Gates, and Minamis in there, maybe this weird unhinged clock lady, or maybe another batch of Gates with the TD finisher combo if you like. Wait, you're telling me 8 Gates are finally playable after all these years? Praise the Lord, man. But, if you're paying any attention to Japanese Twitter, you'll start to notice a build that was not as obvious starting to surface, and I was taking names and winning games left, right, and center. Let's talk about Fantasia's 8 standby build. This particular build is what I liken to a boomer on crutches, except the crutches are standby triggers, and the old man is openly a degenerate weeb who wishes he was a boat in his past life. This deck may look like a janky pile of 50 cards, and I tell you, it totally is. However, the deck takes the standby effect and tries to leverage it as much as it can. The game plan of this deck isn't too flashy, or even overly complicated. You want to fill your waiting room with juicy standby targets to, well, stand by them, and proceed to assert your dominance throughout most of the game. You want to maintain a board presence and building stock behind these massive walls to outlast your opponent by healing, or using a 3-4 event to neuter your opponent's finishes in the endgame, or you poke them to death with two soul beaters. The deck doesn't even run anything that remotely looks like a finisher, although there are options which we will get to later. Let's go through the deck pretty quickly, level by level. If you want a deck list, you can take a screen cap or check the link in the description below. At level 0, you pretty much want to set up your standby targets for later levels so you need to fill your waiting room. Your beater of choice, while usually not beating vanillas up without support, fills up your yard when it becomes averse while fixing your hand. But you also run a playset of quote unquote amagis with global power in your turn to help your otherwise power lacking early game, with some tech that I'll get you later, and a trio of savage brainstormers that have a climax combo to stand specific targets in your waiting room when they're standby out. Other than that, we also have a motley crew of utility cards. We run a pair of roomies that allow you to dig, fill your waiting room, and grab any card from top 4, which include events and climaxes, which will become very important. We also run this neat level 0, which filters your hand, allowing you to ditch standby targets stranded in your hand, while allowing you to control your triggers to stand by them out. This particular deck list runs singletons of the Stock Swapper and Drop Searcher, but feel free to tinker the numbers as you feel fit. Most standby lists also find room for the on-place of Veil and Bounce to add salt to any character, but it's omitted in this example out of preference. The quality of Fantasia's early game is superb, so you're literally spot for choice. The fact that we're not running free runners, clean cuts, or summoners, and they're available in a set is just insane. Now here's some spicy gameplay tech. Sarah is 06 for the Magi and a Brainstorm out. You proceed to play your standby climax or combos from your hand. Now your climax, Amagi, and Brainstorm trigger at the same time. You get to choose the order that they resolve in. So what you do, you clock yourself to use your Amagi first. You take a damage, and then you level up. Then you're able to stand by level 2s. Keep in mind the Amagi also mills, so you can also grab a standby target from those. So you mill 4, grab what you can, and then you can grab 2-2 two -two if it's in your waiting room and put it in standby, then you can pay 1 to stand it, and you're going to be attacking with 2-2 when you start to turn on level 0. Not a bad idea. Although this situation doesn't happen all the time, it's important to know how to stack your things properly, especially when if you want to ball on a chance you may mill your target, you might as well. At level 1, the deck runs 4 of the 1-1 one one that is a standby target for your Brainstormer. It presents a decent wall that is easily kept around with Hang On Core by getting 500 for each other card on the battlefield. You also got a pair of two free 2k non-split counters to keep your board alive. I reminded that this card is a counter, so you don't need to care about color requirement as you really never play it on the battlefield. You also have a copy of the single 1-1 Miku which has three activated abilities. Think of it like a planeswalker of sorts. It either buffs your thick characters out of counter range, bottom decks a troublesome costless card, or heals to stock if you're willingly inclined. Note that unlike most decks, you don't have any costless level 1s like most standard builds, because the deck is using the standby trigger to usually play them for free from your yard. It's quite a crutch, although some decks do run costless options. At level 2 you have your premier standby target, where if you get your back row right, it's a solid 11.5k beater which most decks will have a hard time dealing with. This list also runs a single copy of the 2-2 that combos with your brainstorm from earlier. Now you might think, why are you running a place of the target that doesn't combo while we only run one of the card that does? The answer is that the 2-2 Tomonori, although it doesn't attack when you play it from your graveyard, it's harder to deal with and unlike the other target doesn't lose any power if you happen to stand by over your brainstorm. And before you start going, oh no he didn't on me, there are situations that you'll be doing so, and usually quite often, usually in favour of two ages in the back row. It might also be a pattern of preference. Also the decks in Japan that run this archetype usually don't even run this 2-2 at all, so really it's up to you how you'd like to build a build. The deck also runs a single copy of the 3-5 single target backup, because you may as well, right? 
It's an oversized backup that deals with any opponent's threats that your 1-0 can't in the late game. Now, if you look at a dex at level 3, you'll start to realise something that I alluded to earlier in the video. There's like, absolutely no finishes. The dex endgame isn't to do anything fancy, but to weather the storm your opponent's trying to give you by abusing a 3-4 event to negate the damage of up to two of your opponent's characters by Drew Soul. The event is literally the only reason why this deck exists, and you normally run 4 in this deck. 3 minimum. If you draw this card, you normally greed this card. Besides that, you run 4 Asians that heal and play from hand, but you rarely do, unless you really have to, and they also give global power and climax combo to get it even more power. Keep in mind that the card merely checks the climax is in the climax zone and doesn't check when it's played, so you can stand this out at level 2 to give a healthy 3k buff to your entire board. You can also run 3 Rumiers, which only play on a full board and heal to memory, with some optional double power trigger text, which may or not be useful to get rid of some cards that are troublesome in your hand. The fact that all these cards either heal or neg damage should tell you what this deck wants to do. We also run 1 Sistine. The Climax combo is flavor text in this deck, as we only run this card for the bounce text alone. You run this card to deal with the mirror, or dealing with pesky standby cards like the Futaba Bodyguard from Bunny Girl. It's a meta call to deal with the ever-growing presence of standby in a Japanese meta. Kind of ironic since this is a standby build after all. Some decks also opt to run one or two copies of the box topper restand, as the card does not care if it was played on hand for the turn, so it's a safe target to stand by in a mid to late game to add some punch that the deck may normally lack. As for our climaxes in this 8 standby deck, we run 8 standby. What do you expect? We run 4-4 four, four, both ways. The first climax combos with your brainstormer to summon any of the 1-1 one, one, or the 2-2 two, two that goes along with it, which doesn't stand every character, only these two particular cards. The other climax combo combos with our level 3 Asia. You treat this level 3 as an early play, and sometimes when I play the deck, I keep forgetting that I can't play it normally from hand at level 2, because of how frequent it's normally stand by it at level 2. The climax combo gives 1-5 to your entire board, including herself, so keep that in mind. Even though the static gives 1-5 to others, the climax combo gives 1-5 to everything instead giving a total of 3,000 power to your board that isn't Asia. Not bad. This can lead to some ridiculous board states where you're swinging for at least 15 or more, at level 2 nonetheless. So what does this deck fold to? It can fold to any form of bounce like most standby decks. Think of wormholes, decks that randomly run bounce triggers like Persona, or the random Attack on Titan player that got lost trying to find his way to the English Hall. There is also a new anti-standby card that will be introduced in the most recent sets, however the jury is still out whether they're fully effective. They are still a little bit niche. The deck can also lose to itself when it doesn't manage to draw or trigger its standby climaxes. Remember, you're not running anything that's costless past level 1. Although in this case, we're normally cancelling if anything, and we run Rumiers to decrease the chance of this actually happening. A deck heavily leans on climaxes like a crutch, so if you don't draw them or Rumiers to dig, you're up shit creek without a paddle. Keep in mind if your opponent's severely out, you can't push them as you do not have Global Soul, although you have a million two soul beaters, so make of that what you will. Overall, it's a fun deck, and it's relatively cheap by most standards. It's one of the few decks that I own where I'm happy to open with slightly more climaxes than usual, as you eventually beat your opponent's face and hand in the end. So tell us what do you think, leave a comment down below, or send us an email or send us a tweet whenever you'd like. As for me and myself, I've been uploading pretty consistently every fortnight or so, so I might take this busy time of year to take a good break and relax. However, don't be surprised if you end up seeing a new video in two weeks. So from me here to you, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year.